So our last speaker of this session is uh, Ai Dong Zhang from University of Virginia. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, last talk of the session. And uh, uh, so I will talk about uh, how the newest uh, uh, kind of machine learning called meta learning can be used for cancer prediction. So um, in general, we have seen lately deep learning uh, applied to bioinformatics. Uh, so majority of research actually are in the multi-omics for cancer prediction because uh, omics data have been generated a lot lately. Um, we also see biomedical uh, uh, image analysis uh, a lot and also uh, literature mining, uh, such as what uh, Kathy just presented, and DNA sequence function prediction, uh, protein interaction prediction, and RNA predict, uh, protein binding size prediction. So all these different uh, predictions uh, have been uh, investigated uh, lately. Uh, but uh, we, are, we are seeing the limitations of uh, uh, applying deep learning into bioinformatics because of the uh, very well-known problem called the big P, small n problem, uh, which means we only, although we have a lot of data, we only have a small number of samples in each cohort uh, compared with the high dimensional features uh, each sample has. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, unlike the pixels in the images, uh, like uh, very successful applied in Google competition in images, the patient features such as gene expressions are much noisier and also more heterogeneous. Uh, so uh, these features are not, uh, don't have orders and very high dimensional. So how to deal with this in uh, machine learning uh, uh, context? So for deep learning meets uh, biomedicine and health. So our goal is to design novel models that can make an accurate prediction based on much less training data. So that's our goal uh, uh, in applying deep learning to the bioinformatics. And also we want to develop customized deep learning models that can incorporate the uh, domain knowledge to make uh, more accurate uh, uh, predictions. With that, uh, I hope to just mention, we recently published a paper in AAAI, top AI conference last year. Uh, the title is Semi-Supervised Deep Learning for Cancer Prediction. So in that method, we designed a, a, a neural network uh, which utilizes the uh, both supervised and unsupervised way uh, by utilizing the relationship between the, the inherent uh, gene uh, relationship and uh, enforcing the KNN inside of deep learning. So it can, de we design multiple layers in deep learning uh, with KNN models so we can quickly uh, converge to the uh, better a neural network for prediction. So if you are interested in that, uh, uh, please look at this paper. So, uh, but beyond that, uh, I want to talk uh, about uh, more recent uh, machine learning new trends in machine learning, uh, which make me excited uh, how this can be applied to cancer prediction. So what is a new trend in machine learning? So currently, the research and the supervised learning paradigm is using large uh, and uh, data and the models to generate, uh, uh, generalizing the model and for the prediction. However, you have, you don't, as I mentioned, you don't have uh, that large data set uh, to train this uh, deep learning model. So, um, so machine learning, uh, community is looking at uh, how human really learn. So we have, uh, uh, so if you look at the kids, so kids, uh, how they learn, they have, so for example, they seen cats and birds just a few times, they can quickly tell them apart, right? So 
the and and people you can learn how to ride a bike and normally can quickly learn how to ride a motorcycle. So that capability, uh, you know, it's not reflected in machine learning these days. So machine learning is using a huge amount of data to train the data, to train the model. So can we actually train the model with few data and make a better prediction? So that's what the machine learning community is struggling with. And, and basically we have all this, uh, you know, long tail problem, which you have a lot of small data and how you will train the model. So with that, uh, people lately uh, propose this called uh, meta learning. So the meta learning uh, is to mimic, try to mimic a human learning by training the machine with a variety of different learning tasks, which has only few samples. And so you, you want to utilize that and to be able to make predictions using the few samples in the testing set. And uh, so uh, the meta learning definition more specifically is to learn, learning how to learn. And uh, the good uh, meta learning model property is uh, to, the goal is to well adapting or generalizing to new tasks and new environment. Uh, in general, there are two stages in the meta learning. The first stage is the basic learner, learn the tra learn, le learner trained for, uh, tra for training tasks and update after each task. And second stage is the meta optimization. So updated uh, by the ta testing task. So I would say generally meta learning also has a feature of this transfer learning, how to transfer the knowledge uh, between data sets. Uh, but it's uh, more advanced than the transfer learning. How is the transfer? So this uh, memo is a famous model proposed by UC Berkeley in, in Europe's uh, paper. So if without uh, going to the technical details, just look at uh, this picture. So you are training a matter part, uh, this is theta, the parameters. So this is the global uh, parameters you are training. And then you will be able to use this quickly adapt to different tasks later when you uh, have the tested case. So that's generally the meta learning uh, using the gradient uh, model called a me uh, memo. And uh, so if we more visible, uh, in, in a more visible way, you have uh, the different uh, tasks and each task is small. So here, the top left one is a two way, it's called two way four shots. So it's in each, task uh, and you only have two different classes and, uh, and each class you only have four shots, which have four samples. And using these four samples and with the query or testing case, and you will train the model. So you ha will have thousands of such small tasks and, uh, and testing case to uh, train your model to be able to easily adapt uh, uh, with a small uh, number of samples. So that's what uh, the meta learning is trying to do. And uh, more uh, generally, for example, this one, uh, this one is uh, um, five way, 10 shots. Uh, and, and so using that to train the model. Uh, so the reason I mentioned this uh, uh, new machine learning uh, technique uh, is uh, I'm excited, uh, want to see how this can be applied to bioinformatics, especially, uh, I'm going to skip that uh, page, especially if I assume everybody is familiar with the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. So this uh, famous data set has uh, around 20,000 uh, uh, samples with 33 different cancer types. But if you look at this table in each cancer type, you only have like a few hundred samples, okay? So if you want to train your model, use each individual 
uh, sample set and make a prediction for each individual. So it's normally very difficult because the size of sample is too small. You cannot really train a deep learning model with this. Then you, you will want to use the whole data samples. But we will show using the whole data samples with different approach, compared with the meta learning approach, meta learning can do much better uh, than all the other traditional approaches. So uh, the TCGA data set has all different kinds of features. So you can see uh, methylation, uh, uh, RNA, different kinds of expression and protein extension. We have, we have been using all these data uh, features to uh, test our model. So basically the goal for the cancer prediction using TCGA is we want to predict uh, the classification of cancer. And uh, the idea is to take advantage of uh, the pa label the patient from different uh, type of cancers and design the learning uh, model to be able to uh, adapt uh, quickly to the specific cancer you want to predict. So it's a kind of a, a knowledge transfer uh, in, in the sense that you, if you want to think about uh, knowledge transfer or transfer learning. So the steps uh, uh, in this process uh, using the meta learning is you have sampling and you have meta training with uh, the, uh, each small tasks and for each cancer and you have uh, inner training and uh, meta training and then make a prediction. And so, uh, so we, we have set up uh, using the TCGA data and with, uh, we use the 31 different cancers and I think the 33, two of them are too little, we drop those. And, and then we training classes, so we have a randomly selected 21 cancers. And then validation, we use the five cancers and then the testing classes, we use the random selected five cancers and we use the random sampling applied. So I just, uh, I hope to show you how uh, the latest uh, result we just received. Uh, so using three, so this is uh, the result we got. And you can see we have three ways and one shot, you know, just using one shot in each uh, uh, way each class and uh, and we compare with the KNN random forest uh, matching network uh, prototype prototypical network and memo base so the memo base came uh, the top and it uh, performed extremely well compared with the other method and uh, as you have more shots like five shots you can understand the five shots give more examples in each class, so it performs better in, in this. And when you mix all the samples using the traditional way, some of them are working well, some of them, especially you see the one shot for Kinnan, it does not work well. But if you have three shots or five shots, uh, it works much better. So, that this experiment uh, it make us very excited how we can use uh, meta learning for cancer uh, prediction. Um, so with that, uh, we started to further looking at, uh, you know, how the knowledge can prior knowledge can be used for the prediction. So uh, we 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 want to uh, examine uh, different kind of knowledges. So we look at the uh, prior knowledge in the bioinformatics domain. So you, we, we, you can uh, combine this knowledge in the graph, uh, in the graph point of view. So uh, for example, for image, you can uh, organize into uh, hierarchy uh, categories, different hierarchy. And for patient data, you can organize into uh, different diseases, and uh, so that uh, is very useful for utilizing the domain knowledge. So with that, uh, we first uh, experimented with MIMIC, uh, which is uh, the disease data, uh, very famous disease data with the ICD-9 code, which is more diverse than the cancer, the, the TCGA data. 
And uh, so uh, we have, uh, uh, because the, so the reason we started with the mimic data is the disease, they have the code with different disease code, three di digit code and four digit code. With this code, you actually can well organize them into different categories. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, prior knowledge can be used into the machine learning model and to make a better prediction. So we used this, uh, uh, this graphs and uh, experimented our approach. Uh, and this actually uh, is going to be presented in KDD conference uh, uh, is happening next week. Uh, so we use the, the mimic data with the graph and you can see this uh, and our approach at the bottom. So this uh, uh, performance is much lower than the TCGA because um, the mimic data is more diverse. So we experiment with a subgraph sampling means we only sample the tasks from uh, the, the subgraph defined this way. And you can see uh, the, subgra the subgraph uh, performance is lower than if random sampling, because if you restrict it to subgraph and it, they are more homogeneous, so it's more difficult to detect, uh, to distinguish different uh, uh, diseases. So random sampling actually performed better. So, uh, so that's uh, what uh, in the mimic data sets we, we perform and we compared with all different uh, kind of uh, uh, latest uh, approaches without uh, prior knowledge. And uh, we uh, show in this uh, uh, chart, uh, the, you, with uh, prior knowledge, uh, we can achieve better performance in general. So that is the mimic data. Now ongoing research, uh, what we, we really wanted to do uh, is to still go back to the cancer uh, to uh, predict the survival outcome and analyzing the gene set across different cancers. Um, so we also want to perform uh, interpretation of uh, the predictions. So. Um, in the survival analysis, uh, uh, we, there is a difficulty because you have uh, uh, censored the data, which you don't know when uh, you know, the time uh, specific event uh, occur. So we uh, combine with the Cox, the famous Cox model into the survival analysis. So that is a, a um, predefined uh, process. Now our ongoing research uh, here, uh, more uh, difficult part uh, compared with mimic data is uh, how to combine uh, the cancers into a, a prior knowledge graph. So we don't have, there is no such predefined uh, uh, graph to categorize all different cancers. Uh, by collaborating with uh, Virginia Medical School uh, faculty, we, we uh, uh, lately, so we have started to combine uh, different uh, cancers into graph by calculating uh, the expression data. So if you use uh, the expression data, then uh, you can build different graphs. So in cancer, there is no unique uh, defined uh, graph like the mimic disease ICD-9 uh, code. So you have a you, you will have different graphs uh, built by different expressions, the protein expression, gene expression. We'll build the different uh, graphs to be used for cancer. So, so that's what we are uh, doing right now. So I don't have the result yet on this uh, uh, graph. So uh, basically the, the uh, meta learning based approach for the genomic uh, survival analysis. So I think uh, my time is up. So uh, generally, we, we have a, our goal is to build this uh, meta learning based approach for su survival analysis. And we are going to use the TCGA uh, with all different uh, uh, samples and uh, 33 different cancers. 
And uh, so there are 78% of censored data to be used in this research. And we are going to build uh, different graphs based on uh, the prior defined cancer categories using different uh, features and see how that works. So, so that's a general ongoing research we are doing. Um, so I want to uh, conclude uh, my talk uh, uh, here. Uh, I, I, as, uh, so there's, there is a still a long way to go, I believe. And there are many interesting problems in bioinformatics and health informatics for which new machine learning methods can help. And uh, the, this research requires a very close collaboration between computer scientists and domain experts. So, so the machine learning method can well incorporate the domain knowledge into the prediction model. Okay, so I will stop here. All right, thanks very much, Adam. We had a, um, I'm on, there's, I'm there's on a, time. Yeah, there's a couple, right on time, right on time. So I have a couple of questions, one uh, somewhat specific, and then I'll also throw that general, general one to you at the end. But first, we'll start with the specific one. I had a question about uh, the types of biological data that would make them good candidates for the few shot learning applications that you described before. Biological data is very heterogeneous. Your applications were uh, very sequencing based, but there are also image data sets. There's other types of uh, biological resources that are available. Um, just want to know your thoughts on which ones you think would be good candidates for that. Oh, well, that's a very good question. So in general, I think uh, uh, all different uh, data set fit into this model. And uh, the imaging data actually have more bioimaging data. And imaging data fit well with this because uh, it has, uh, you know, it's proven the image data can, in general, can make a, a very good prediction using the meta learning. So, uh, as I said, the, the problem is uh, with different cohort. Each cohort has uh, very few uh, data. So, so I think the meta learning will fit well with the uh, cancer prediction or other diseases. Uh, but uh, we needed to be able to de design advanced approach how we. The, the, the research, the new research here, I think, is how to incorporate the different biological knowledge into this model. That's something new to us uh, to, to make a, a good advanced model for, the, for, for machine learning. So that fit well with the theme of this workshop, like knowledge guided machine learning, right? Mm. So mm -hmm. I think it's exciting how we can incorporate the different uh, knowledge into this model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one, one example that comes to mind outside of the realm of cancer uh, is this effort called the Human Protein Atlas, which is trying to localize every protein within the cell. And I know mm -hmm. that there are certain cellular sub-localizations that aren't occupied by many proteins but something is targeting them there, something presumably in the sequence. So you could envision a learning where based on sequence information with only a few examples that localized to some rare mm -hmm. subcellular localization, you might be able to attempt some type of uh, learning like this. So, okay, let me ask the, I'm gonna ask a good closing question uh, here that got thumbs up, we'll save it to the end. General question for any of the session speakers, which means you. <laughs> uh, does translation, what, what does translational biology mean? Does it mean making data usable in many, different disciplines or something more specific? So what, is it, what does it mean to you? Maybe any, any speakers want to take it first? Anybody want to take it first? Uh, for me, when I think of translation biology, I think of RNA to protein. Um, maybe, the, but, but the other thing is this kind of flexibility to it. I guess you could say, from my standpoint, some of the things that I talked about basic science to more bedside clinical applications, that type of bed to ben, uh, bench to bedside translation. Um, but I think that there's enough, it's a big enough tent that many um, definitions could fall underneath it. I do like the idea of use and reuse for data for different applications beyond the ones that the original data creators had intended. That's supposed mm -hmm. to be Mm -hmm. the long-term view and the long-term value of these data repositories that people will 
come up with creative ways to deploy them beyond what the original intention was. Yeah, to follow up uh, uh, that question, I think, uh, you know, uh, this uh, translational biology can be very well used in drug uh, purposing and compound design because you have, a, you know, different uh, uh, drug, you know, the compounds you want to design and they normally have fewer samples or you have a prior knowledge uh, in, you know, a lot of prior knowledge you can uh, apply to the uh, process. Mm -hmm. uh, Marta, you have something uh, to say? Yeah, I was yeah. say, Marta, so we turn the video on, so she has something to add? Yeah, I, I wanted to give a sort of a different perspective on it. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are here to replace or that we claim to replace the experimentation, the chemists, the biologists, or the physicians, but we reduce their hypothesis space. We point them to, you know, a, a, a narrower set of credible hypotheses so that then they can take the ball running and, and get to the right answer much faster than if we were not in the picture. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the main points of this workshop is that a straight ML application doesn't get you there. It doesn't give it from the experimental standpoint, none of that gives rise to the types of hypotheses that we would really be able to test in the, in the lab, but perhaps by this hybrid approach. So what, Kathy, you had some to add? Yeah, yeah. And I think that really is the take home for this workshop, right? Uh, brings together uh, domain scientists and uh, machine learning experts, uh, computer scientists uh, to really uh, do this in a, in a very collaborative interdisciplinary uh, fashion. And, and I think one thing that is really exciting about this initiative is that the framework is supposed to be adaptable, uh, whether uh, we are looking at the environment science or health sciences or any other application domains. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I think it would be, it would be really uh, exciting to see what come out uh, from the discussion regarding the, the type of reusable module. You were talking about the FAIR principle, right? The reusability, uh, interoperability. And so um, oftentimes we talk about that's, you know, how you codify the data so that it will be reusable. But in terms of the models, uh, the machine learning models, how, how could we uh, design in such a way uh, that it could be applied to uh, various data types. And as long as we, we have good understanding of the feature space, I think that would be, that would be extremely exciting. Excellent. Well, I think that that's about as good of a way to end this session because it's a great uh, transition to the closing panel that we'll be having in just about an hour's time. Um, and so we'll close the translational biology session. Thank you for everyone uh, who participated.